The Unlikely Innovators with Mike Comito and Steve Gravel. Presented by Cambrian R&D and the Center for Smart Mining. All right, Mike. I was going to start out, start off with a little bit of a uh, another song. Uh, I was going to I was going to hit uh, She Talks to Angels because today we're talking to an angel investor, Daniel Graham, uh, who, of course, is the managing partner at Phoenix Fire, uh, an investment, a new investment fund that focuses uh, entirely on uh, female founders. Uh, but I digress. I didn't do that. Um but perhaps talking about it is worse than doing it. So what do you think? I I mean, I think that would have been a better choice. I thought you were going to do a happy birthday because technically by the time you're listening to this, this is like, this marks the one year anniversary of the unlikely innovators. Um, But I don't want to talk about that right now. We'll talk about the one year mark, maybe in the, in the post comments after Danielle's interview, but, uh, but no, it was a real treat talking to, to Danielle today. Obviously I think, you know, the reason we wanted to have her on, I think was obviously because of the work that she'd done, you know, with fierce founders and the work that she's now doing with Phoenix fire. But obviously I think for you and I, it was a real treat uh, because of the shared uh, history background. I think, you know, she kind of talked about how, you know, I think maybe this is part of the, you know, we got off, got offline and kind of chatted a little bit and how, you know, you know, doesn't necessarily bring up the history uh, education that much, just because I think a lot of people still maybe, you know, view history in, in spaces like tech and investment as, you know, what, what, what relevancy does that have? But I think hopefully you and I and this show has proven that people from humanities, you know, bring those skill sets that are so valuable, um, whether it's securing funds or, or making investment pitches. Um, so it was great to kind of get that lens from her and see how that's maybe shaped, uh, you know, part of her journey. Yeah, I think uh, this episode will hopefully encourage more history nerds to let their history nerd flag fly. Um, no, it was great to hear that. Uh, I think, uh, you know, she and I know each other from a past life, but uh, it's great to see how she's, uh, she even had, uh, obviously, that the lens that she uses in investment back when we were at OCI, and we share a, uh, a connection with uh, Lily Lamb, who was the, uh, the investment manager at, uh, at OC at the time, and she really taught me a lot about uh, how to recognize what's, what a good pitch is, what a good investment opportunity is, and I'm sure she shares that, um, but uh, I think what we should do is in order to uh, hear more, we should go to Danielle. We are now joined by Danielle Bruin-Graham. Uh, Danielle is managing partner and co-founder of the Angel Stage Investment Fund, Phoenix Fire. Uh, she's previously held investment roles that included principal to Sandpiper Ventures and Dreammaker Ventures and manager of seed and pre-seed stage market readiness fund where uh, we met at OCE, now OCI. So it's good to see her again. Uh, and she also founded Fierce Founders, uh, the first female focus accelerator and boot camp series in Canada, and has obviously been an active champion for women and diversity initiatives across Canada. And we're now so happy to be joined by Danielle. Thank you, Steve and Mike. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, and it's great. It's it's super great to uh, to see you again. Um, so we we like to. Um, uh, sort of keep things uh, generally light, but one thing that just sort of leapt off the page when we were we were doing a bit of background on you, um, and and we never talked about this when when we when we were at OCE together, but you have a master's in history, um, and so do Mike and I. Mike, in fact, has a PhD in history. How did you go from studying conflict in South Africa to now uh, the VC and angel world? Oh, great question. I'm glad to see we all have that in common. Um, I, a lot of it stems from my background. I actually grew up in Africa, lived in uh, Southern and Eastern Africa for all of my childhood. And so when I came to Canada, I went to U of T to study international relations. And I had a professor that inspired me, Margaret McMillan, uh, who wrote Paris 1919. Mm-hmm. And so she um, really encouraged like political philosophy and history. So I kept that going through my master's and was studying uh, the conflict in Angola, which I had actually lived through. And throughout that process, though, I really kind of had to, I, you know, be personal about the fact that I'm a very extroverted person, uh, very naturally entrepreneurial. And so I did not want to spend my life in a library. And I was very jealous of all the MBA students kind of out there socializing, living their lives. And so I decided to do an MBA and I was interested in entrepreneurship. So I went to Waterloo and that was where I started my first company. And I received OCI funding, which I don't know if you know 
that full cycle story either from our time together. So um, yeah, I got into entrepreneurship and an MBA and I think that just suited my personality so much more in terms of a career. Like, I think a question that kind of like dovetails into that, Danielle, is obviously we already mentioned that we're the, this is the History Gang podcast today, although that I didn't even know that before we booked you. We just wanted to have you on to talk about, you know, Phoenix Fire and the work you're doing with that. Um, and then we, when we got, saw your bio, we're like, oh, this is great because we've had, you know, folks in the past come on who have humanities backgrounds and then end up working in in science and tech, right? So one of the things I wanted to ask you is obviously, you know, from a personality perspective, you felt that going the route you did was a better fit for you. But certainly, I would like to think that your your historical training has served you well in your career. Are there any parts of, you know, your historical training that you kind of say, you look back and say, this, you know, I'm able to do this, or I'm a good communicator because of that? Is, is that is that the case with you? Uh, absolutely, actually, I think it was it was such solid foundations. And, and that was something that my entire family had encouraged because a lot of my family are historians or um, uh, what you call academics. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad had even done a master's in African history. So I was very much encouraged in that direction. And my MBA in entrepreneurship is, is the kind of black sheep piece. <laughs> um, so for me with history, you know, I've been able to write proposals. So writing the Fierce Founders proposal, all of the work I've done to champion um, initiatives from at the forefront of tech and innovation and diversity and inclusion have, I've, I've known that I've had that skill set. So I'm able to kind of not only take the ideas, but write them, implement them and get them funded so that then I can be that active um, voice in the ecosystem for underrepresented founders. So very relevant. And then of course all the analysis and you know environmental factors that you talk about in history come into play for so many of the reasons why um, women and um, black and indigenous refugees newcomers are all underrepresented in terms of financing for tech startups but they're building exceptional companies so there's a disconnect between the data and the facts and who's getting funded and, and who's getting that, that support. It's interesting to hear that that sort of lens is uh, something that's sort of foundational to you, you know, like uh, the history that you read and write and then how that sort of impacts where you end up going in the sort of tech ecosystem innovation space. Um, speaking of that, uh, I, I know Mike and I have this problem all the time, and I should say before I move on that I did share that jealousy of the uh, business students all the time. They looked like they were doing, uh, first of all, they looked a bit more stressed uh, than, than most, uh, but maybe that's uh, the bit of the, the suit they wear, but uh, uh, they did look uh, you know, like a really interesting career path for sure. So I'm glad we all ended up uh, sort of in this space or this space adjacent. Um, it's often very difficult for me, and I know Mike has said this before, to explain to people what it is I do in the innovation ecosystem. It might be a bit more straightforward for you because you know you you actually capitalize these these early stage uh, ventures. But how do you explain to someone that you're in something called an innovation ecosystem or a tech ecosystem? Is that easy for you? It's it definitely difficult, and and my family certainly still doesn't understand it. Um, but I definitely think I starting with, you know, venture capitalists, right? So, you know, capitalizing on ventures is the simplest definition. Um, But investing in early stage technologies is a very clear way of saying, you know, we're putting our money where our mouth is. But there's such a broad range of activities that come with enabling good decisions and the right opportunities. And then on top of it, once you've invested, that company needs every type of support you can imagine. So there's really no limit with entrepreneurship, which is both, it's, a, you know, the most amazing part about it, but also the most difficult part. Yeah, and really tough to describe, right? I remember when we, when I was at OCE working with companies, you know, you end up being a, an advisor, it's a sounding board sometimes. Uh, and of course, when you end up sitting on, uh, on really early stage uh, advisory boards and things like that, you're almost a counselor sometimes, right? Like it's a, uh, it's uh, it's a, a really um, holistic approach you have to take to investing sometimes with with those with those early companies. Yeah, I would even you know add like therapist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To the list um, because the hardest thing is sticking with it in some cases, right? Believing in the vision, believing in the opportunity, 
and and sticking with it. You know, I've had so many fierce founders who have wanted to quit the program at some point or another, just for personal reasons and surrounding them with a community and those support structures has led them to, you know, continue on and then see these incredible announcements. And I can think back to the times when they certainly didn't see that potential. You know, you talked about the supports just there uh, really quickly, but one of the things we wanted to ask you, and this obviously I think will seem like an obvious question because I think we all know what the answer will be, but I'd love to hear it from you in terms of, you know, when it comes to supporting, um, you know, those entrepreneurs and those early founders, can you talk about why it's so important for everyone to have access equitably to unlocking capital and what that means and how it makes a difference in, in them getting over those, those critical first stages? Well, I mean, Essentially, you have a network where there's a lot of different pieces that can come into play. And I think one of the challenges is that different that people have different levels of access. A lot of these programs are government funded. So there should be kind of a broader community um, access point. And so that I've seen not happen in every case. It's, it can be very insular. And I experienced that as a, as a founder in my first company as well and at Laurier. But I was already in the ecosystem by you know, going from university to Laurier Launchpad to Communitech. So I had that pathway, I had that opportunity and I had that access. And so when I started Fierce Founders, the first bootcamp, and I went actively out to recruit, I think that was actually the secret sauce was that I was going to places where women entrepreneurs were and telling them, and making them feel comfortable to come into a space like Communitech. So sometimes it's active recruitment, sometimes it's sourcing and finding that talent and then enabling it through these access points. And so then the same thing happens at the next stage when you're looking for investment, where if you don't see people who look like you, if you're not comfortable in that space, then you're not gonna relate to it and you're going to bootstrap for longer, you're not gonna get the support systems and you're not going to grow as fast or as big. So that's yeah, it, really it, important part. Yeah. yeah, it's a huge point because, uh, you know, I think when you think of like investment in venture capital, like if people who are uninitiated in that world might think of like, uh, like the yuppie culture of the 1980s. And I think some of that still persists, you know, like this is for white guys you know, that are, that have come out of university and, and know some wealthy friends that might own a hedge fund or run a hedge fund or something, but that's really not what we're talking about anymore. Right. This is, this is much more community-based and grassroots investing than, than, than that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I didn't know those stereotypes not growing up here. So I was just surprised when I was suddenly the, you know, only female founder who received smart start funding in 2014. Right. I'm hold like, on, hold on. I have to interrupt you. Is that true? <laughs> you were the only, there were, there were no other female led. I went things? through this whole list. It was like 150 oh. and community made a whole big deal out of it. They're like, and, and it was only because I was the one who submitted as well. I had three male co-founders as well. So perhaps there were names that weren't included in that list as co-founders, but it was literally like John, John, Chad, Brad. And I started Fierce Founders after hearing that. I, uh, well, and we don't work there anymore. I, I, well, I hope that that alerted someone within the organization, like saying, you know, we really got to, <laughs> we really got to work on this. I know when I was there, I, I squired a couple of female founders through the Smart Start. So I'm happy to say that I did my part in that way. But my gosh, like 2014 is not that long ago, right? Like that's, uh, that's a bit shocking. Sorry, that that's a bit of a digression, but that kind of blew my mind. Like, well, I'm, I'm glad that I heard because why are my, are my, I mean, you know, I ended up working on the inside at Communitech and OCI uh, as well, because I did want to actively change those numbers. And you're talking about a bigger sociocultural phenomenon here as well. Like by the time you're getting to funding and and venture capital you're really at in some ways the end of the pipeline around you know what companies are founded what companies are being brought in to all of these incubators mm -hmm. so then when i looked at communitech stat that year it was eight percent of founders uh, of teams had a female founder on them and so we moved that up to 30 percent by the time i left communitech 
and that's been shown to be more of the national average for accelerators, but it's still, in, you know, if you think about a team that has a female founder, not 30% women and 70% men. Yeah. So the rest of them are only men. And so you're walking into these orientation rooms, into these events, evening events, as sometimes the only woman in the room in a very, you know, kind of congenial and social dynamic, but suddenly you're the one who doesn't hear about, you know, that extra 5k grant or that extra opportunity, because it's not being positioned in a, you know, kind of a professional newsletter all the time. It's being positioned as, oh, you better hit that deadline at midnight, you know, it's, it's very entrepreneurial, which is great. But what I've been doing is building out opportunities for more of that kind of network effect with women, because women want to support each other. And the peer to peer groups that I've been able to create for female founders have been exceptionally supportive for each other. So it's not about saying like, no, this shouldn't exist, like let energy fuel where it exists because entrepreneurship is, is already so in many ways vulnerable, mm -hmm. but create more avenues and more opportunities and more communities. And so with Fierce Founders, it did that, but then also the Center for Indigenous Innovation, the Black Innovation Fellowship, Jumpstart for Refugees, creating communities of like-minded people who've had similar experiences, who can support each other and understand each other's experiences but then provide those access points. So they're moving to the next stage. They're finding like-minded angels. They're able to prove their metrics in order to get to the series A rounds. So that's a lot of kind of what my philosophy has been. Yeah, and I think it's an interesting, uh, it, there's, it, I'm not gonna say culminating because I would assume that you're done. And I, I think you're far from done in, in the world, that's for sure. Um, but now you've you've started this, uh, uh, or you're you're working on this Phoenix Fire Fund uh, managing partner. Can you talk a little bit? I know this is brand new, but like the the firm's investment philosophy, like what lens are you? I'm sure the lens you're using is what you've used since your time uh, in that first startup, right? Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely, Steve. So I mean, definitely applying a gender lens. So all the general partners are female. All the investors are female. And all the focus is female. So uh, really creating a community, which we call the firehood. Um, and so we've got a model where we're creating those connections in, um, you know, in a, in a position where women angels and founders and investors and partners are all the minority. But when you create these connections, you have an exceptional founder who suddenly has access to these networks and the women who have invested in our fund are executives at the banks consulting firms have had their own ipos or um, massive multi-million raises so they're really already trailblazers and they have that same experience and they want to share and they want to give back and they put their money where their mouth is but that's just the one part the financial capital it's much more the social capital that we bring to the table. And, and Danielle, I know that we, we, when we were talking offline, you obviously, and Steve alluded to this as well, that obviously you're still in the early stages here. So we're not going to get into like the, the nitty gritty details just yet. But in terms of, you know, launching this, I think obviously the way you've described it, um, I would I would have to assume that like has the, the support or the feedback you've received so far when you guys, you know, first initially launched that this was happening. What has that been like? And, uh, and is it encouraging you to keep to keep going further? Where, where are you at with that process right now? Yeah, it was a, a pretty exceptional <laughs> reaction when we launched um, International Women's Day this year. Um, you know, we had we had a, a pretty epic photo of, you know, several of us on a, on a couch. One of our limited partners. I'm looking, I'm looking at it right now on, on beta kit. Yeah. Uh, one of our um, LPs is a manager for the Desperate Housewives of Miami. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Janelle Ernest from Brand Talk. So she um, did a great job positioning us. And unfortunately, not everyone could join because of COVID or, or um, you know, ice storms. But We've got more in the works to showcase who our LPs are, who the, what this exceptional network is. Um, but for me, like my first post got 40,000 impressions. So it 
it was a pretty exceptional uh, launch. And I went to a Women in VC event this week. And I'm just starting to see people and see their reactions in person for the first time. They're like, that was the best photo for a VC <laughs> launch I've ever seen. Um, but another element to all of it is that the majority of our team and our investors are women of color. And this has been a massive gap in the conversation. We have an, you know, an indigenous woman from Saskatchewan who invested, exceptionally experienced woman building a blockchain company of her own because blockchain was actually not regulated on indigenous reserves. So they've been building for a lot longer. So it's that intersection of, you know, difference, but also then that becomes your competitive advantage, which is why perspectives are so important in this ecosystem. And we've got, you know, women of color in Vancouver and across Toronto and a, a strong contingent in Waterloo as well. So we're really excited to showcase these exceptional women as well, which is not necessarily a, a typical VC model. They don't often showcase their LPs, but these are women who are, are very much bought into our mission, bought into our vision, and, and want to show that change in the ecosystem because people didn't believe they existed when I said I was going to raise this. That's incredible. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, I think um, it, it's interesting, and I know uh, when I when I think about like the blockchain and things like that, is it? I don't want to be naive here, but um, the trends you notice uh, in the type of companies being started by female founders does that track basically of what's hot in the industry, or are there divergent trends among female founders in your view? Just like what market segments they end up uh, starting companies in. Yeah, there's definitely different market trends. Um, and but what when I'm focused on tech, that's really where you get kind of this minority group. And then it does trend more um, a common kind of around the same numbers. So you get smaller numbers of women entrepreneurs, but higher performing women entrepreneurs. And so we've seen that in data, especially like Boston Consulting Group. Um, mentioned that if you give a woman a dollar of investment, she returns 77 cents in revenue, while as men return 31 cents in revenue. And so you're seeing this trend around, you know, fewer women, but higher performing women. And so that actually enables us to make a great thesis and invest and, and show those high performers. And, and I don't know if once there's, you know, more of a 50-50 state, if the, you know, those metrics will change, that's my thesis on why they're so skewed, because I also do believe in men, <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, so I think it's it's the state of the nation where you have these challenges and these barriers, but the people who overcome those barriers are truly exceptional. And so that's who we're investing in and who we're enabling, but we're also building that pipeline through collaborations within the ecosystem. You know, I was up in Sudbury for NORCAP pitch, meeting companies, meeting individuals, hoping to showcase the, the opportunities that exist for them and also get them engaged earlier on in programs like Venture Lab, where we have the capital investment program. We're able to support companies from across Canada who are earlier stage, who are looking to do their first fundraise and give them access to advisors and pitch sessions where they can come forward to angels and because it's virtual it doesn't matter where they are yeah and i think um it's interesting i i, I think in the states it's further along but as far as like investment communities uh within the sort of public consciousness in canada i i like to think that people don't think that vc and angel investment investment is like dragon's den and that's the sort of only kind of you know, you do your pitch and then they, they say I'm in or out. Uh, uh, I like to think that there's uh, more vibrant communities across the country. Do, what do you think is sort of the state of, uh, I w I'll say the state of the investment landscape, but uh, that's a bit of a general question we could spend a lot of time on. But what do you think about, and if you don't have an interesting answer, we don't have to talk about this, but uh, what do you think the state is of like sort of the uh, the public consciousness of, of investment uh, in Canada, uh, talking to the people that maybe are uninitiated uh, into this world? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question. I do think that, you know, if anything, 
Dragon's Den and Shark Tank and, and these shows have actually enabled the public to learn more, um, even if they're not 100% accurate to the way that we operate. And, you know, we would never say, and for that reason, I'm out, unless we're <laughs> a little douchey. Um, <laughs> but I do think that it's, it's showcased something to, to the broader public that now is accessible and understandable. And so it is relatable in that way. And yes, we have our nuances and our models and we're obviously, you know, a different type of profession than, than, you know, TV show professionals. But I do think that it's aided um, understanding because it's sometimes the first analogy I make <laughs> so that people can understand what we do. So from that standpoint, you know, there's a lot of gaps in terms of access to this type of field. It is really niche in many ways, right? It's angel investing. You have to be a high net worth individual. You have to have, you know, a salary of over 200K or 300 with your partner. You have to have a million in liquid assets to even begin participating. There is an effort to do more crowdfunding. So if you are not accredited, you can invest up to 10K if you're in Ontario um, through a lot of equity crowdfunding sort sites and exempt market dealers. But at the end of the day, it's not for everyone and it's very risky and it's a profession, but it's a niche profession. So I think it's important for the public to know about it because it can be so influential in which companies and what innovations move forward to influence all of our futures. But at the same time, where do they go? How do they learn? How do they access it unless they're gonna dig in? So that's where some of these angel networks are, are coming up and, and we're certainly doing our part with women um, to offer some angel education. That was one of the things I did at Sudbury for an audience of 20 angels, um, and mostly physicians actually. So you don't have to be part of this tech space in any way to participate in something meaningful, especially if you have subject matter expertise that you can offer an early stage founder who needs that access point. Yeah, it's good to get some of those physicians to stop uh, investing in real estate and actually putting their their money into some cool tech ventures, I think, right? Um, that's something I noticed locally that a lot of physicians do end up uh, taking the real estate route, which is still, you know, rewarding and meaningful. But uh, I think we can start diverting some of that to uh, to companies that may not know that there's something other than bootstrapping in banks, right? So, um, yeah, no, that's great. That's super cool to hear. Well, and one thing, Danielle, I wanted to pick up on was that you obviously mentioned you were here, um, you know, recently for, for NORCAT's pitch competition. Um, unfortunately, that was game six for the Leafs that night, so I did not go. And Steve had mentioned that he's been planning this big BEV conference that by the time this episode drops will have already, you know, passed and hopefully been a great success. Um, so one of the things I wanted to ask you is that obviously you got to witness the pitches, you know, that night and over the years, you've obviously seen a lot of pitches um, one of the things that we'd like to do at Cambrian is we have an annual event called the Student Innovation Challenge, where we're trying to encourage those students, you know, in the undergraduate level here from a variety of program backgrounds, you know, that have an idea, whether it's a business idea or, you know, a new tech that they want to develop, where they go through similar to a Dragon's Den style, uh, you know, competition where they pitch their idea to a panel of judges. And so, you know, one of the things that one of our BDs, Cody, is obviously focused on over the years in developing this is, is the art of the pitch and, you know, how to craft a, a concise and I think persuasive pitch. But if, if you could, because I think this would be instructive for, uh, for a lot of our student listeners, um, you know, what are some of the do's and don'ts that you've seen over the years? You don't have to get into the specifics of who did it, but like as a general <laughs> rule of thumb, what would you say are the, the do's and the don'ts of, 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 you know, selling a good pitch? Well, um, I, I do have like my like top 10 red flags uh, for this topic, but I do think overall, there's so much that can be improved very quickly in a pitch, just to see a good example, just to mm -hmm. see a really good example, someone who, you know, delivers it, has great visuals, then just copy them. <laughs> like, just literally see a good example and understand how to position each slide, what types of slides you need and, and how to tell a compelling story. So the biggest thing for me is you're doing this pitch specifically maybe for investors. There's lots of different types of pitches. There's sales pitches, there's you know business and partnership pitches. 
But if you're looking at a, an investor pitch and the type of pitch that I would normally judge, you're looking at telling a story, a story arc that will intrigue people enough to get you to that next meeting. So you have to convince them of the problem, convince them that you've actually come up with an effective solution, convince them that you're the type of person who can actually deliver on all of these elements, and then dig into the strategy and the go-to-market and, and the apps, right? Like drive the conversation forward in an effective way. Mm -hmm. And I think people get too bogged down on you know, the problem or they get too obsessed with their one solution. And that might not be the best solution. That might not be the end result solution for their company in the long term. It's a process of discovery and iteration as you go. And I learned those core concepts around, you know, lean business model and, um, and market validation and ensuring that you're iterating as you go so that you're offering the best, most scalable, most viable solution because you're obsessed with a, a problem and it's a real pain point. It's not a nice to have. It's not an info commercial where you're op you can't open milk. You know, like it's a real problem. <laughs> yeah. If only there was something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't I cut. I can't. Though. I can't cut a tomato <laughs> with this knife, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think you're right because again, I've seen this over the years with the students with their pitches that they think they have to sell like this is like a, a groundbreaking thing. I'm going to blow your mind in this five minutes. But it's like I think viewing it as this is the beginning of hopefully getting to the next meeting and scaling up and iterating. Um, I think that's really really instructive. But I do have to ask you. I'm not going to ask you for the top all ten of them, but I have to. If we can get a few of those top ten red flags you mentioned, what would be let's say if you're your top few of the top ten. Yeah, well, they're just, some of them are more like, I would say yellow flags. So I don't want to okay. intimidate people, right? Because at the end of the day, they're just indicators to me mm -hmm. that you're, you might be early in your journey. So, uh, which is, you know, the nice way of saying, mm -hmm. maybe you're not ready for investment. And so with, you know, saying we're, we have first mover advantage, I consider that first mover disadvantage because you're looking at a net new market. You have to then be the one to do all of that intensive marketing and build this out. And so if, even if that's a true statement, which often, even when they say it, it's not. Um, and then on top of it, they'll say things like there's no competitors in the space. Well, that's also a major red flag because yeah. it has a lot of indicators. One, it could mean that no one's interested in this space. So that's mm -hmm. actually a bad thing. Uh, it could mean that you haven't done your research and a quick Google search can um, show me that you're wrong. And, and I'm here listening to you tell me why you're the market expert. And so I want to be informed and I want you to prove that to me. If I can do a two second Google search, no more than you, then that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So those are some of those key things where they think they're, they're showing a strong point. No competitors, first mover. And those are definitely initial red flags. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... Um... Mike and I talked about this in the past when we've had uh, people who've raised money, uh, significant money on the pod in the, in the past. But one thing I always hated when we were, when we were doing this, like at market readiness or anything like that, or even judging, you know, as an OC rep, you'd get a, a guest judge at a pitch competition. I, for some reason, didn't like the, like when people weren't genuine with a, like when they go into what I call pitch voice, you know, like what they may have seen on TV. And it's like, man, like, are, are you actually telling me that you're in to this or is, is this just something you saw on TV that always just annoyed me. And I've tried to replicate it a few times on the podcast and I never quite get it right. But <laughs> like, it's, it's just like this sort of cadence that they have. That's just, it's not real. Right. Yeah. I a hundred percent know what you're talking about. And um, <clears throat> I don't know how to imitate it either. <laughs> um, but, but now when I hear it again, I'm going to lock it in. And, uh, and next time we chat, we'll do an impression. You guys I can do a, a pitch voice off. <laughs> yeah, I think I better. I could. I could probably do it if I had like a couple uh, glasses of wine, and then uh, I'd be way better at pitch voice. But uh, I'll try it privately first, and then before it's live. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for, yeah, you gotta practice. But it's absolutely true. You know it almost like immediately the way that they yeah. start. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. I'm glad that I'm not the only one who noticed that, but I'm sure uh, a bunch of people have. Um, Danielle, you've, you, thanks so much for spending time with us. Uh, we had a great time. 
I, I was going to say something like, uh, I really hope you are very successful in recruiting uh, more members into the firehood. Is that something that can be said? Is that how that's, yeah, is that's that how you? That's, that's exactly how it, how it goes. That's, that's where we're at. Oh, that's great. So uh, really, really happy to have uh, spent this, this last half hour with you and thank you for sharing all the knowledge you have. And I, I do think that uh, some of the things uh, we talked about will be instructive to some of the early startups that do listen to the podcast and some of the students that uh, are in the innovation challenge. So thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, well, Danielle. I, I think uh, I think I speak for a lot of people when we're we're glad that you left academia behind and went in the route that you did. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you can always go back, right? There's always that call of the PhD for anyone yeah. who's spent too much time in post-secondary education. So um, I definitely appreciate you guys reaching out. I think that you know, talent comes from everywhere, and I'm keen to see even earlier stage like high potentials. There's so many of those ineffable elements of an entrepreneur that I think you guys will probably be pulling out of your students and, um, and I'm happy to share more resources so that we can, we can get them, you know, maybe not on the dragon's den stage, mm -hmm. but, you know, collision, mm -hmm. startup fest, we got our mm -hmm. own stuff going on. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's terrific. And of course we'll do that. Thanks so much for the time. I hope to see you again soon, especially now that we can meet, uh, you know, out in the world. Yeah, I'll come back to Sudbury. Well, that was a great interview with Danielle, Steve. I think, you know, one of the things I said, and I, again, I hopefully it doesn't come across, you know, maybe the way that it, it sounded when I said to her at the end of our conversation that I'm glad, you know, that she left academia. Certainly, I think, uh, you know, that's, uh, I meant it in the sense that I'm glad that she had chosen a divergent career path, right? That I think all the good that she's doing, you know, up until this point, I think the work that they're going to be doing with Phoenix Fire and supporting women and women of color, um, is, is just incredible, right? So I think ultimately, you know, she made that choice because she felt her personality was better suited to the business world. Um, and, and, you know, I think it is, but I think ultimately, you know, making that choice and going the route that she did, obviously, you never know if she would have stayed in that in that particular lane. Maybe we wouldn't be talking to her about Phoenix Fire today. Maybe we would have been talking about something else. And that would have been fine as well. But I think just the work that she's doing uh, and the important work that they're doing through Phoenix Fire is, is, is going to be so uh, valuable. Mike, you'd almost say that she's an unlikely inv innovator. Hey, maybe, you know, yeah. <laughs> That'd be a great name for a, for a podcast, which, uh, you know, speaking of, of podcasts, named the Unlikely Innovators, which is, we're the only one as far as I'm aware of. We're on we, it right now. We're we, actually on the podcast. <laughs> you're listening to that podcast. We did do our market research. There was no other podcast called the Unlikely Innovators. So thank you, Steve, for doing that. But when you're listening to this, if you've been listening to this podcast, uh, from the beginning, we've hit a year. Yeah, I mean, get the cake out, uh, cut it however you're going to cut it, but we, it's time for us to have some birthday cake uh, because, you know, we actually did it. We said we were going to do it for a year. Um, we committed to that early on and we did do it. And guess what? We ain't stopping. No, we're not, we're not going to stop. I think as long as um, you and I still keep uh, performing uh, at, a, at a high level at Cambrian. And I think we still continue to have guests that agree to talk to us and they, you know, continue to, I think, enlighten our listeners. We'll keep going for, for as long as, uh, for as long as we're having a good time. And yeah, like you said, we're not stopping. So this is not uh, one year and done. Um, I wish we could, would have had a stat on how many podcasts make it to the one year mark. Right. Cause I feel like, you know, you, you put out, you know, after months and months of content and you're just, you know, at what point do you say like, ah, nobody's listening to this or I'm going to pack it in. Like my mom, you know, keeps sending me texts about it. It was a great <laughs> episode and, and that's Same. great. I appreciate those certainly, but, uh, but you always want to, you know, make sure that you're doing it, I think for, for a greater purpose. Right? And I think with, with you and I, you know, we obviously had talked over the years about doing a podcast, you know, in, in different subjects. Uh, but I think for us, like the main reason we wanted to do this was to, to shine a light on applied research in Canada at the college level, and then also bring some value back to Cameroon by having, I think, some of these, these great guests we've had on and share their stories, which are hopefully instructive for our other partners. And of course, I think in this particular episode, our students who are aspiring to, to own their own companies and to, and to make, make pitches and get investment. Yeah, and who would have thought we, we'd actually sustain a weekly podcast? I know that some people do bi-weekly or monthly. Um, we're bringing the content every week, ladies and gentlemen. And I think... Uh, 
you know, it's still fun. I'm still, I'm having more fun than we've ever had doing these. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's as long as it's fun and as long as we can bring good content, we'll keep doing it. So thank you, know, you I, everyone who got us here because we wouldn't be able to do this without the support of the people that actually watch it every week. Yes. So I think, you know, I, 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 yeah, I think that's a great point to thank everyone who's listened over the last year. You know, we've also got onto YouTube. Uh, thanks to our producer, Paul, for suggesting that. I know it was a blind spot for you and I, because I listen to podcasts on my phone, but a lot of people watch podcasts on YouTube, right? So I think, you know, you'll continue to see that trend over the next uh, year as we go into year two is audio and, and, and video. Uh, but again, I think in, in honor of having Danielle on today, I think you and I keep bringing the heat every week. I actually know. Sorry, I meant to say the fire. Oh, oh no. <laughs> well, as long as we don't go down in flames. Oh, OK. Well, anyway, it's uh, it's it's truly been a pleasure bringing these episodes. We look forward to more guests. And again, we really hope you enjoy this conversation with Danielle. Um, and again, I think hopefully it'd be great to see, as you mentioned, Steve, to to bring more you know, women into the firehood, especially if, if some of those, you know, happen to come from Sudbury, that'd be great as well. The Unlikely Innovators with Mike Comito and Steve Gravel presented by Cambrian R&D in the Center for Smart Mining.